So uh, we're very appreciative of her uh, willingness to come up and uh, share important information that is always in flux, especially during a legislative session. So Dr. McCormick, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I forgot to do that. You're good. <laughs> First of all, I want to, ooh, I'm blasting everybody away. So first of all, I want to thank you because anytime I get an opportunity to come north, it's a good day. So I appreciate the invite and I appreciate being here with all of you. I also appreciate someone behind a camera and a Purdue sweatshirt. Go Boilers. <laughs> and those who are not clapping, I apologize for your IU season right <laughs> off the bat. <laughs> So, but again, thank you, truly, it is my pleasure to be here. More importantly than anything tonight, though, there are a lot of moving pieces to public education and to education in general. So I wanna kinda get a gauge of who's with us. So, teachers, where are you? Bless you, go find friends. <laughs> Administrators, let's do building level principals. Central office, do we have some charter school folks? Okay, proud grandparents. <laughs> Yay, good job, good job. Very good. Support staff. Support staff. I know we have some tech folks in the audience. Retirees. Yeah, well, we're all jealous. <laughs> Keep your hands down. So again, thank you for having us. I'm going to go through a PowerPoint to kind of give you a brief update of where we are as a state. Some of you who are in this room who've heard me speak before are like, lady, we've already seen that, but some of you have not, so be patient with some of it. Some of it's going to be an update, and boy, I tell you what, the State House is busy. So as we go through things, a lot of these are moving pieces of legislation that will have an impact on all of us. So it's something to be paying attention to and make sure you're being informed. I have quickly learned that I'm, this is no surprise to some of you, people take advantage of complacency. And so whether it is we're not paying attention because we're busy, or because people don't want to testify because they don't want to lose their jobs, or people don't want to make their local legislators upset, whatever it may be, or the legislator who writes the bill really doesn't want to read it. You know, it's a lot of complacency. I'm, I'm concerned about that, and all of you should be concerned too. So I commend you for being here to educate yourselves, but if you do nothing with it, that too is complacency. So we need your help. We need your help. I know I've been here several times, and the first time I came up, it was quite interesting. And so some people were still trying to figure out if I was crazy or, or what, what I was going to do. So hopefully I kept encouraging people, pay attention, pay attention to our actions, pay attention to the department. And hopefully, based on our team that we have, we've got great experience. We have a lot of educators on our team. We are here to support schools. We're here to support our 1.2 million students. And hopefully you have been proud of the department. That is our goal. So with that, I'm going to jump in right off the bat. I share this everywhere we go. Hopefully your local schools are doing the same. But sometimes when you get within your own community, you don't see the big lens. This is who we are. The one picture or the one part up here that ch challenges people and really shocks them is the number of languages spoken. Because sometimes I get into rural areas and they're like, yeah, but there's about five. I'm like, no. So when you get into certain areas, it's really a relevancy piece, but there are 291 languages spoken with our students as a primary language. Now, that is an opportunity for the state of Indiana, but there is an expense associated with that, and we're going to talk about it, but that's an impressive number. The other one is the free and reduced number. So it's going like this. And when I start talking to our legislators and tell them that free and reduce is going up, they're like, how can that be? Because unemployment is going down. And I said, go ask your teachers. Wages. They will talk to you about wages. wages. They will talk to you about the working poor. They will talk to you about families who are working multiple jobs. They will talk to you about grandparents who are raising their, their um, grandchildren. We have about 66,000 of our students that we are servicing that we know are being raised by grandparents, and I'm sure there are many more, but that's what we have reported. We have about a huge number. We're one of the top in the nation of having kiddos who their parents are incarcerated, which brings its own set of issues that I know administrators and teachers and everybody's like, yeah, we know what that means. 
but there are just a lot of pieces up here that we need to pay attention to because it tells us who we are. It also tells us about our priorities that sometimes we begin to question as we're having conversations at the state house. Special education population is incredibly high. Our, I was a special ed teacher and so I know what that means. Again, opportunity, but some challenges. Our autism numbers, not a surprise to you. <laughs> so, driving you crazy. The autism numbers are soaring. I'm going to move these apart maybe. Good. So the autism numbers are going up. Our other numbers that are going up are the other health impaired numbers. So we're paying attention to that. Oh, I thought he was coming to help. Just kidding. <laughs> hey, hey. He, he must know my husband. <laughs> Okay, so, but this is an area that we also need to pay attention to because of the districts. We are about a third, a third, a third in suburban, urban, and rural, but you all know the needs of that are vastly different, and so we're having those conversations. Indiana is very good about saying, hey, we're going to slap this on legislation and one size fits all. That does not work. We are the Ellis Island of the State House, which is pretty interesting when you are where we are in Indiana. So I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent. If you want to help kids, learn about kids, help education, we want to meet with you. We want to help you. And so that's been an interesting approach, but that helps us in the arena of looking at districts that are suburban, the rural, the towns, because they're very, very different. We try to encourage stop the one size fits all. The needs of Indianapolis public schools and the needs of Cass County, any school in Cass County are vastly different, and you all know that. So we like to remind those that are making policy to try to make good policy, which is sometimes a challenge. <coughs> Something to pay attention to on this slide. Unfortunately, Indiana is losing 35%, now think through this, 35% of our teachers between years one and five. Now, if that's not a crisis, what is? And I would challenge you, who's having that conversation besides the Department of Education? Who? So are you hearing any rhetoric that makes sense coming from any of our elected officials? I would beg that question. 35%. I'm not sure with all the demands being put on the classroom, with all the return on investment that they're looking for, how that's going to happen if 35% of our teachers are leaving between years one and five. That is a huge, huge conversation we need to continue to have. The other piece of it is House, and, or house Bill, it's not House Enrolled 10, it's, I'm sorry, it should be House Bill 1003, came out and basically a lot of the folks at the State House said this is the solution. Teachers are going to see a 5% increase. Those of you who are in education, those of you at central office or at principals, you know it doesn't work like that. So just because the state says we're going to give you an X percent increase or because we're forcing you into funding that's going to produce that, that's not the most honest conversation that they've had and I have let them know you are making false promises to teachers and so when you go to the bargaining table and you have a superintendent going I don't have five percent to give you but yet the state house is telling you that they do that's going to be an interesting conversation 1003 is that bill that's forcing schools to put 85 percent in their education fund 15 percent in operations if you are getting hit by the circuit breaker which are property tax caps some of your districts are you can't put 85% in the education fund. You can't because you got to have utilities paid, your buses, bus replacement. So to make that promise is irresponsible. So I'm telling you right now, you need to tell your teachers, 1003 is not the answer. Are we going to have rhetoric or are we going to have action? So some of our districts are like, we can make it. We can hit that 85% all day long because we've passed five referendums where we have great title monies. And then I go to a district that hasn't passed a referendum that desperately needs a referendum and they'll be lucky to put, to put 25% or to move any amount, but that 8515 is going to be very, very difficult. So, so just paying attention to that legislation of what's going on. We did see at the department our largest increase in teacher licensing since 2000, which is a good thing. But when you're losing 35% of them and you're one through five, it's hard to get super excited and start that celebration. But I know in special education and in secondary, some of you retired teachers that had your hands up and you're all super happy, we need you to come back 
<laughs> Need you come back. But it is a problem. It's interesting because people say, they, I get this a lot, they'll come and they'll say, you know, we've looked at your books and you have about 200,000 licensed teachers on the books, go get them. And I'm like, well, some are deceased, hard to get. Some are, some are retired, like some of you who are like, I'm done with that business. Some retirees do come back, but others are, they're, they're, they're finished. They don't have desire to come back. So the, the books in Indiana with our teacher licensing gets very interesting because it's not always reflective of what's available. We don't clean our books like that. That's not the way our licensing department works in Indiana because of a lot of factors. But when people t start telling you that, hey, you have 2,000, go get them, you need to tell them good luck because that's not the way that works. Administrators will call and say, I have a chemistry opening. I've got no one. It's not that they're trying to choose between applicants. They don't have any applicants. And that is more so than not in a lot of our secondary areas, special education, some now for elementary we're getting to that point. So the crisis in education is real. So when people tell you it's not, you know better. I mean, you know better and you need to have that conversation. This is also us, which is quite interesting when you look at that. The number of kids that we're serving at the very bottom, I don't know if some of you can see that up there, but at the very bottom, our total schools are going down just a bit. The total number of students are going down just a bit. However, I would argue the funding has gone down rapidly, but the amount of schools that we're funding has gone up as far as facilities. So you've had a 54% increase in charter schools, which is not a surprise to many of us, but that number is significant. So when you have the same or less pot of money and you're trying to spread it thin, it's a capacity issue. So we have a lot of moving parts with that, but the 54% or 52% increase and the 17% in the non-pubs, which goes back to vouchers, those are the items that honestly are impacting a lot of things. Now we can have the conversation about choice all day long because our biggest choice in Indiana is traditional public to public. That's where our, most of our movement is happening because people have said, we believe in our public schools in Indiana. Many of them are making the choice of that is their choice as our public school system, which is a good thing. But we cannot ignore what's happening because again, those monies are not reflecting what's happening with servicing more and more buildings. That's different than children. So if I have all these new buildings popping up, I need more teachers. I need more finances. I need more resources, but everybody needs them. So it's just something to pay attention to. We share this with our legislators as they're making decisions. And again, philosophically, we can have that conversation, but we're at a capacity conversation. When where is enough enough, what is our ceiling. What is that ceiling? Because I tell you, I, we, we go out and we look at some of the schools that pop open and my team comes back and they're like, mm, we probably need to look at this. I'm worried about quality. I'm worried about they open, they close as quickly as they open up. I mean, there are a lot of issues going on. And then there are some, whether it's traditional public, charter, non-pub, there are some schools that are doing a great job across the board. But there are a lot that we should be woefully concerned about. There also are those schools that are taking common school loans, millions of dollars in the state of Indiana. They take this common school loan, they take it, Six months later, they leave. Do you think they repay the common school loan? No. You try to do that at a traditional public school. The superintendents in this room are, and the business officials are going to tell you, nah, that doesn't cut it. You, you can't do that. So it is an interesting dynamic right now going on with this slide, going on with the funding. But it's something we need to may aware, be made aware of. This, too, is something we're paying attention to. Interestingly, in the state of Indiana, the accountability does not pay attention to subgroups does not. Our ESSA plan, which is the federal plan, does. And when you look at these numbers, you probably want us to pay attention to our subgroups. That gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Whether it's graduation rate, whether it's AP access, whether it's AP, like advanced placement performance, <laughs> this gap's getting bigger. And when you start to have that conversation in our state house at times, it gets real quiet real fast. Because our accountability system, the state accountability system, does not account for that. Again, we wrote the federal with the Department of Education and we do account for that. Now I understand if I'm at the district level, it's hard. 
because when you're paying attention to subgroups, you know what that means. I mean, there's a lot of accountability. There's a lot of area for growth. Some of our areas are, are some of our cohorts are very difficult to move. Our EL population, our special ed population, some are very difficult, but we're paying attention to it. If we don't pay attention to it, we're going to lose sight of it. The other issue with our state right now is in our state accountability system, we do not account for every child. So literally, you could have a child move through the system and not be touched at all by accountability in some of our areas. Not at all, ever. Not in graduation rate, not in iLearn, not in iStep, not ever, ever. Not in our accountability system. In our federal system, the department put together every child's accounted for. Because I'm worried about those kids who are slipping through the cracks and we don't even have one touch on them. At least have a graduation touch on them, see if what cohort they're in, figure out where they're at. So we're watching absenteeism, we're watching graduation. But there's a very big difference right now and it's getting further and further apart in that accountability system. Graduation rates, boy, this one stirred up at my friends upstairs. So they asked for the data, we gave them the data. You know, facts are kind of stubborn, sorry. So when we gave them the data, we said, this is the graduation rate. So what we did, when you break it out, and it's a little bit confusing, traditional public schools have virtual schools layered in them. But, virtual, but charter schools also have virtual charter schools layered in them. So we broke those out because they're a bit outlier-ish in their performance. So we took them out of the mix, but you can see where we are. I have to say, for traditional public schools to be over 90%, you all should be patting yourselves on the back all day long because that is an accomplishment. I think anytime you get over 90%, and sure we don't want 10% to fall through the cracks, but 90% and higher, that is a celebration because the classroom is hard, the environment is hard, it is complex, but when I see this, I'm like, we're, get, we're doing it. We're getting a lot of things done that aren't being celebrated. Now every superintendent wants that to be higher than that. Every superintendent, every principal wants it to be higher than that. Every parent wants it to be higher than that. But if you stop and pause, for us to be over that 90% threshold is a celebration. Now what worries me are the areas that are hovering at 40% graduation rates, because there's a lot of money flowing into some of those areas. So without us looking at this and telling the story, shame on us. But you have got to celebrate your accomplishments. You have to do that. And I know populations are different. I know there are some districts that like we're hovering at 80, we're trying to get it up. And you go into some districts, they could close their eyes and they're at 98% and they're gonna be there forever. So it re I, I get it. However, you've got to tell your story. You've got to make sure people are well informed. Your teachers are working hard. Your administrators are working hard. Your support staffs are working hard. Tell that story. But this is something to celebrate. Over 90% is quite an accomplishment. Our enrollment. Why do I show this? Because the money follows the child. So if we don't pay attention to this, we're all in trouble. So in Indiana, our enrollment on in, from 16 to 18, so year 16 to 18, you can see those numbers that 157 of our 289 districts are declining in enrollment. What does that mean? Your monies are going down. Your monies are going down. That is a significant number to think through. 157 are declining in enrollment. Some of them, when I meet with them, I was in a smaller district as a superintendent, so I was around 2,500, so small. But if I lost 20 kids, like I was not happy because I knew what that meant. And any little bit, you know what that means. Now others, when I run into them that are the bigger machines, are like, yeah, this year we lost 600, which gives me a heart attack and it's given them one too. But it's, it's just amazing at the numbers. And, and there are some districts that are still just, I mean, they're, they're exploding and they're big and they're getting a lot of kids. But we do have to pay attention to that because that is a factor of economics. It's a factor of a lot of things that sometimes is out of the control of the local school system but we need to pay attention to the enrollment piece the population why do we pay attention to that because when we're looking at some of our areas in Indiana you have 37 of our 92 counties that are also declining in population that is correlational so if you're losing population in your county you probably are losing enrollment in your school district and most of you realize this but when you start looking at it on a big scale and the magnitude of loss and and the trend, and I know superintendents and CFOs are watching it, but it is alarming. So some of our districts are in trouble and I don't see any way for some of them out of that.
because unless you have a big machine of a company or some economic boost, there, it's going to be an uphill battle for some of our districts. So something else we're just paying attention to. County populations and school enrollment. I kind of tried to pick up here a little bit to make it relevant for you. This is just by county. How many of our uh, how many of your schools and with population, what's happening? So the green arrows mean that many schools go up. The red obviously is going down, and you have some that are pretty much stabilized. But when you start paying attention to this slide and these numbers, it really does tell a story about certain areas of the state. And many of you in this room, that's not a surprise. However, if we're not paying attention to it and we're not sharing that information then it doesn't do us much good so all of that needs to be sh um, paid attention to I know our superintendents watch that birth rate because you're trying to look at the kindergarten down the road and some people have a formula and they're real scientific about it I mean I, some are better at that than others and some pay attention more than others but this is another area that I know our business folks and our superintendents and our principals are watching they're watching it like hawks because around September when your count dates up and you're, you people are hounding you like who's in did you get him in you know it's it's quite interesting but this is another area that just tells our story referendums it's kind of a sore spot in areas but referendums I want you to pay attention to this slide because we've had 66 attempted our percentage is pretty good as far as pass rates. So they have been pretty decent. Now there have been areas, and I'll be the first one to admit, if I tried to pass a referendum in my past school, it would be an uphill battle because I had a lot of retirees and a lot of farmland. It would have been different, but there are districts in Indiana, I can stick one sign out at one stoplight and I can pass five of them fast, easy, without much lift. I mean, they're a lot of work, but the dynamics of the community drive so much of that. Interestingly enough, out of the 66 that have been attempted, you can see 26 of them, only 26 of them, were districts with declining enrollment. So the other big chunk of schools, the 40, had increasing enrollment. And I would argue many of those declining schools are the ones who desperately need the referendum. And people are like, you know, it's their own fault. I mean, I talk to people upstairs and after I take a lot of arrows, I'm like, okay, so lay it out. But they're saying, it, this is your option. This is the new day. Go for a referendum. Your community is going to either help you or not. Go, have the superintendent go for it. The issue becomes, they're saying, why are only 26 with declining enrollment actually trying to get a referendum? Well, first of all, if you ran a referendum, they're very taxing. They are expensive. They have, they have to have a big lift out of the gate. And some corporations and some communities are going to struggle with that. They are not easy. So I've had superintendents go, I'm not even going to try because I know I can't, if it doesn't pass, the amount of resources, the amount of money that I've put into it, they're having those conversations. So we've challenged our General Assembly, what do you do to level that playing field? How do you even get them out of the gate to be able to try to get a referendum? Where's the seed money? I mean, I know it has to go through a pack, but what do you do with that? So I think too, this is the conversation that no, not very many people are having, but when we go upstairs, we tell them people are trying to do referendums, but that is not a guarantee. So when your General Assembly are saying, you've got the mechanism, go get it, it is not that easy. It is simply not that easy. But this is just good information to know about total referendums, but that general one is quite interesting. Right now, you need to pay attention because there is a bill and it's getting some movement. We've been told different things and I'll believe it when I see it. But there's a bill right now that if you run a referendum, then they can give part of the referendum, you run it, the, the public school has to run it, but if you win it, then you have to give the chunk of it to the charter schools based on their ADM. So, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> so, what it does is literally, however many charter schools are within your district, let's say I have three charter schools, they all have 100 kids. That would be 300 total. So those 300 kids, the ADM collection, it would be proportional to that amount would come out of the referendum that you run. So the onus, the work, the responsibility of the, tr of the actual referendum is on the traditional public. But if you win it, you gotta share a proportional with your charters. Now the question on the ballot, which we have raised, 
is basically the same question but it attaches onto it. It's a referendum and it gives your, your amount and all that, kind of like it is now, but it also puts in, it's for the, your school, you name the school, and the charters. It doesn't give you the option as a citizen whether, okay, I'll pass a referendum, but I want the monies to go here, or yeah, I'll pass a referendum, I want the monies to go here. It's all, all in one, which I think is highly confusing. I think to my, my own father, who's in Henry County, who's a big supporter of Newcastle Community Schools. That's where I went to school. That's what we know. He's a huge supporter still of Newcastle Schools. I worry about if you put a question like that on a referendum, he'd say, yes, Newcastle, but I think he'd be like, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know. You know, he'd have a lot of question about do I want, where do I want my money to go. That's not the way this works. And so silence on this is not good. Now we have been told that there will be amendments to that bill, but we have not seen any amendments to that bill. I cannot be the only one going out and saying that there is something not right with this. I, I can't be. We have to have help. You have legislators. You have their information. You need to tell them, proceed cautiously or don't proceed at all, depending on your opinion. But that is one that it's hard enough to pass a referendum. And my argument is we just layered on confusion and another barrier because it's going to be tough. So that's, yeah. Is that House Bill 1641? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you read it? Yeah. Yeah. Voucher impact. This is another one that's getting noisy again. In a time which interesting, I thought we won't hear a word about this because monies are so tight. So that's me being naive still. So what happened was we didn't hear anything about it. This is the voucher impact of up here. That remember, you could not, I run into that people all the time. They're like, you know what, that doesn't impact us. We don't lose a lot of kids to vouchers. It doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. Everybody loses money to vouchers. Whether we agree or disagree, that's a whole other conversation. But you need to know how it works. So there's a pot of money. The voucher comes off the top of a pot of the money, comes off the top. You may not lose any students to a voucher, but you have lost off the top. So this is the fiscal impact. So when people get mad at your district and say, hey, be fiscally smarter, do this, do that. I mean, I've heard about all my districts inefficient. I'm like, they're losing $2 million a year. I'm like, that's hard. So know these numbers, share these numbers. It is extremely important. Right now there is a bill going through that we are down to one count date. So what that means is student counts in September when the kids come in, you submit the number, that's your dollars. We were at two counts for a while and that was kind of a nightmare on a lot of levels, but typically all of our school, traditional public schools fall. So on that second count you took a hit. Most, some, of, some of you didn't, but most of you did. So you take that hit on the second count. Well, finally, they moved it back to one count, which was a good thing, I would argue, for the majority of traditional public schools. Well, now the conversation has come back because they want two counts for vouchers. And if two counts come for vouchers, that means they can collect in the fall, they can collect again in the spring. If the two counts come for the vouchers, the two counts are probably going to come for all of us. So here we go. So when traditional public schools are saying, you got to get us some money, you got to get those finances and resources up, I would argue we're going to take a hit right off the bat if we go to two counts. And some of you would know what that looks like because you typically don't go up. You have graduates in December, you have mobility. There's a lot of reasons. I mean, as a superintendent, I rarely, I mean, if I broke even, I was super happy. But you rarely go up unless you're just uh, you know just growing for an odd reason or whatever but it, that's concerning so that is kind of moving kind of not moving and they're trying to massage that we have been pushing for no one count one count for everything don't, don't uh, that's been our stance on it don't go to the two counts but that will impact this that will greatly impact this we're also hearing from parents who call us and say here's the situation I've gone to my private school I can receive a voucher okay well they hold the voucher so now the window application is closed and the school says Sorry, and so the child has to go has to go back to their traditional public school because the application wasn't. Well, the application was submitted by the parent on time. It just doesn't make it to the department on time from those schools accepting vouchers. Now, some make it and some don't. So it's interesting on what that will do with that second count. 
So it's something to pay attention to. I just, I'm a little bit worried, especially for the traditional pubs that are gonna take that hit in that second count and you have to readjust all those finances. That is concerning. I'm just full of good news tonight. <laughs> okay. Here are strategic goals. I won't spend a ton of time on those, but just so you know, we are focused on literacy, we're focused on career tech ed, and we are focused on STEM. College and career readiness wraps all that in. Something to pay attention to, a lot of that we are in alignment with a lot of what the state's doing as far as career tech ed and STEM, because you don't want us going one way and the governor's office going another way, because guess who's not gonna get any money? That's us. So we're trying to stay in alignment to, one, push what we need to do as a state, but also make sure we're in a position to capture some of those resources. I mean, us battling isn't gonna help. So we're trying to position ourselves well. Something to pay attention to, the career tech ed areas. So some of you would have maybe known that vocational education. I know I go into areas and they're like, is that shop class? I'm like, well, you know, 50 years ago, yes. So we have that conversation, but with career tech, ed the conversation has really kind of morphed itself to only a certain amount of those classes are going to count toward a concentrator which is toward your graduation now only a certain amount of those classes are going to get funded and it's very narrow and so I would highly suggest that you do a little bit of homework on that because at a time again where you're not real sure what's going to happen to finances I promise you unless you have really adjusted quickly you will take a hit in your career tech ed you will because I was the person that had like foods one I had you know your facts classes I had peace, preparing for college and career I had finance I had global economics I had that in a comprehensive high school a lot of those are not going to be funded after next year and a lot of them aren't going to count starting you know in a couple years so we have to readjust some of that you can still run them you can, your high school principal knows this they can still run them but your superintendent's going wait because we have no money for that. So that's gonna be the problem, because you're, you're gonna have a lot of kids, I'll be the first one to admit, kids like foods. They love to go, I mean, they, they, and it's not a bad thing to learn to cook, I wish I would have paid more attention. But <laughs> it, it's a good solid class for many of our kids, and some of the kids are taking harder academic rigor, and, and they're like, I wanna take that. They enjoy it, there's a life skill to that. Those are the very classes that I'm getting very concerned about because a lot of people say you got to focus on high wage, high demand only. Well, first, that's very fluid. Second, that depends on the region. Third, that, that data in Indiana is interesting how we're coming up with that. But I know for a high school principal, who are my high school principals? Oh, bless your hearts. Um, it, it's hard. It's, it's fluid and you're trying to figure out. We have grad pathways coming at us and so it is a, it's a hard, hard job right now. For And your middle school principals are trying to backward build and help out and you're, they're all like, what are we doing? You know, so I know there's a lot of movement right now with all of this, but that career tech ed piece is going to be huge. Our strategic goals, we are rolling out resources as fast as we can with literacy, with social emotional learning, with a lot of our frameworks. I wanna take a pause on social emotional learning. Interestingly enough, we are one of the highest states in teen suicides from 16 year olds to 22 year olds. And what's interesting about that is when you start saying like we're, we're usually top two, top three, which is not a good top five you ever want to be in. I make more calls about student deaths than you can imagine. I mean, it is alarming. And so not, and you know, it could be for reasons, homicide, suicide, accidental illness, there's a lot. We try to call what we hear about, we don't hear about them all, and it's still a lot. The suicide piece is alarming. But when all the bills came out for school safety this year, there was no mention, no sniff of SEL. It was all about hardening your school, an app, the, you know, d doing more cameras. I mean, it was the same, it was that. Now, I'm not saying that's bad, because you have to have it all. But for us as a state not to recognize that social, emotional, and mental health has something to do with this, it are people who have not been around a building in a long, long time. So all of you know the impact that has. It's like, are we gonna be proactive or reactive? I think we need to be both. I mean, we need both. 
Luckily, it got amended. We got a little noisy. I think social media, thank you if you helped us. I know we were given fifth step stairs, but we got some amendments in with social emotional, but I promise you that's because of the noise we were getting from our schools that got to our legislators that said, you've got to be kidding me. Now we had some great legislative partners upstairs that were also saying, you've got to be kidding me. So that social emotional piece, really the Senate helped us out quite a bit with that, with Kreider and Head and Holdman's been great with that, but it's the those not little things it's those big things that we're paying attention to you are all are paying attention to but yet we got to have the connectedness if you make policy without a practitioner voice it's never going to be good policy and so we're trying to make sure we're, we're, we are present in that conversation we have a ton of stuff going on with STEM, and I give credit to all of your schools, all of your teachers who have said, we're gonna get on that bandwagon. We've started our cyber as a state. We've started our computer science. We're starting to have an aggressive K-8 curriculum with our vetted curriculum for science. We're trying to provide more training. We're doing a lot in this area to capture that money. We have a great STEM plan, but we need $10 million a year, 20 million over the biennium. You know, the governor came out, his proposal was two and I'm like 18 more we're good we got it so I'm working on that um, but if you're going to have a plan and you want movement you've got to fund it and you all know this I mean it, you, your priorities your priorities so we're hearing from our workforce we're hearing from a lot of folks to say it just can't be a conversation about computer science although that is extremely important it can't be a conversation just about cyber although important it's got to be a much broader conversation not even just about science technology engineering and math but about the skills that that the kids are capturing from that content, the experiences that they're getting. So we have some work to do in that area, but that is a biggie right now that that ask is big. Again, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. Um, we have robotics teams. We're leading in the nation on that, and that's not because of the Department of Education. That's because all of your schools and the th people who say, I will sponsor, a lot of those people do that for zero dollars, and that is a lot of work, or a tiny little stipend. We're like, here's your $600. We'll We'll take it the next 10 weekends you know so it, it's a lot of work so I give credit to those who are willing to sponsor it because it's right for kids without much asked in return but also to the administrators that let those people go They're like you know you want to do it we'll find a way to make it happen so a lot of great things that are happening in our schools that sometimes we don't hear enough about so for those of you who have received stem acceleration grants or you're doing the cyber pilot or whatever the case may be you're doing a lot of this on the screen thank you I know it's a lot and I go back to our high school principals are like well, what comes off the plate because we keep we keep adding and adding and adding and our and our capacity is getting squeezed and the stuff that I see some of them doing is quite amazing I'm like that that's pretty good so I have faith in our administrators but I also am very aware of what what this means I mean it, it is sometimes a lot I'll be the first one to admit it Again, a lot of this we've talked about with Career Tech Ed, but I would watch that piece of legislation right now that's requiring, now remember some of the funding's going away, but now we're gonna require a CTE course. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think you better be careful on what that looks like, what you're offering, how that's posturing, because that's not, go, I, we've worked, walked, watched several amendments and that's not going away. So right now where Grab Pathways went through, which means your kids have a lot more to do to graduate, if you watch some of the bills that are going through, they're layering on to grab pathways. They're layering. You've got a civics test right now. You have a CTE course to box one. I mean, today it was work-based learning is the only thing that's gonna count in your accountability. So if you do box two and you do service or you do project, you're out of luck. So they're kind of going, here's your choices, kidding. We're just narrowing it down. So pay attention to what's happening. And I know you're like, lady, we're busy. And I get it. So we're trying to give information to the principals association, superintendents association, and we're saying, can you blast some of this out? or can you get to certain folks to help us out? But the grad pathway piece is interesting. In the accountability of 1404 is quite interesting. So if I'm an administrator, if I'm a superintendent and I just wanna look at something, especially the high school piece, elementary got stripped from it, they left the high school piece, look at it. Make sure you're paying attention to it. We've never done accountability that way, which is our A through F system. We've never done it that way where we circumvent the entire public voice and the field, except for a few, and the department, they circumvented us and said, we're gonna create an accountability system 
system. It was a cheap shot workaround around transparency. And so you need to read it and get to your legislators. We've never done it that way. We've always been very open. We don't always agree. But we've always been very open, let public comment, let our feedback be heard. This way was, here it is, it's going into a bill. So there's not much wiggle room, but it is very limiting. So pay attention to 1404 if you haven't looked at it. The budget is, is a big topic because of the teacher pay, again, the most promising thing I think that came that has been brought up right now I would say is the idea about teacher retirement where they would completely fund it with some of the surplus and also help offset the cost of turf to our districts which would be a cost savings now for some of our little tiny schools not much but we'll take anything we can get we have to be careful when we start saying that's not enough because it was some so that was promising that it would take care of turf make it hundred percent plus healthy and in, in the turf world as a whole in the state, but also help each local school on the percentage a superintendent has to pay on that turf. So that would be a cost savings. That was good. Now 10.03, that, uh, that wasn't so good. But some of the conversations we're hearing are, are, are interesting with the budget. We went after a 3% raise, and I know I got pretty beat up out of the gate because of the revenues, but I'm not backing off of the 3% raise. We'll continue to have that conversation. We have one, we've been through two budget hearings. We have one more but three percent is not even going to get us to where we need to go but it's better than what I'm hearing so anything you can do with your legislators to help with that conversation if we go out guns and blazing and say we want 10 percent you're never going to see 10 percent so when we get to that extreme they're, they shut you down so we said at least three now remember just because you get a three percent or if you get a two percent doesn't mean every district gets a two percent increase we will still have 30 to 35 percent of our district districts take a pay take pay decreases because of the way the fu funding formula works so again pay attention to what's happening but that budget conversation is quite interesting they got aggressive out of the gate and when they realized that people and, and a lot of the superintendents spoke up the CFOs and said stop that conversation it's not fair it's not accurate it, it's rhetoric so and you know it, it helped but it's still kind of lingering out there we will see what some of these bills do but the budget piece is going to be huge this year um, virtual education is another one give me strength so <laughs> I, I get it I mean now I gotta preach so what has happened is you have some virtual schools that are, are, are in the trouble I mean th their performance isn't great some of them are at four percent grad rate not good however I'm not a firm believer that you throw it all out because of certain performers some outliers because you do have kids and you have them in your communities that are let's say they're a big time athlete and they're traveling, they're an Olympian, they're going, or they're ill, or because of their special situation or at-risk kids, traditional public schools are not good, not good for them, and you're trying to figure out what would be good. And some of you are encouraging, what about try this? You know, so for some of our kids, that is a good option. For some of you, you are running virtual education heavy. You're using your learning management systems, you have credit recovery, you have credit acceleration, you have online classes that people can't get to access to unless you do it that way. You're trying to get your eighth graders what they need. Many of you are running your preparing for college and careers all online because it's, it's get it in, it's requirement, money, la 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 la. So there's a lot to it. Here's the situation. And those virtual bills, and they're still going, a virtual charter school or a virtual school gets 90% of the funding. What this is doing is lumping in any child in virtual education. Now think through that. Like we're going back to 1970s if we're doing that. Like we're way going back. So if they're saying anyone in virtual education for X percentage of the day, you only get 90% funding for that child. So at Yorktown, it was not uncommon that if I had a kid in credit trouble, he, they may be on credit recovery for half the day. They may be. And they may be in, you know, out working the other half or in traditional classrooms the other half. Those are the kids I'm worried about because those are the very kids or the very programs that they're saying you're going to get 90%. So when you go to your superintendent as a high school principal and go, hey, 50% of my kids are 
hitting that definition, they're not going to be happy. And it's not not happy at you, but they got to figure out they just took a 10% cut on that population. And that is hard to adjust to. That is hard. And so we are watching those virtual bills. We have provided language. Senator Melton was great to work with us. Senator Rotz is working with us. I mean, they're coming from all different angles on that virtual bill. It was intended to help the solutions with virtual charters. It has become virtual education is bad. And so we are trying to change that conversation, but pay attention. I know we even had the conversation today where they were trying to find that percentage that deemed that kid in. And some of it, the conversation, I, I mean, it, it was just getting a little interesting because I'm like, when you have schools that are one-to-one, -one, one to some, they're living on learning management systems, you have hybrid of instruction going on, you're running e-learning days, whatever it may be, Superintendents are going to be put in a really interesting situation to make some really difficult decisions. That is a bill that I keep saying significant pay attention. But the most significant bill I would argue at the State House right now is 421. Everybody's like, Ch -ch -ch -ch. so 421 is a bill that, and we've been working with the author who's Bohachik. Um, it is a bill that says this. So if I'm District A, and I, I, my neighboring district is B. So you follow me, A and B. If I'm District A and I decide over here in District B, I want this township. I want to take this township. And I want them to become my district. Not just the kids, we're carving your district out. So I want that district. So I can, if District A's school board passes a resolution and that township the trustees board, which passes the resolution, they can go. The ex exiting school, District B, can do nothing. Now, if District B wants to turn around and say, uh-uh, we're taking you back, they can pass a resolution, and the trustee can pass the resolution again and try to get them back. That offers a lot of problems. So I brought up the scenario of I'm District A and I want the high school of District B because they have a lot of kids and that will close them down to be a K-8. So I'm gonna go after that township because it has the high school building in it and it is against the law for a district to have a building that is indebted or leased or owned outside of your district. So if I'm District A, I'm like, I'm taking that township because it has your high school and I can do that. And there's really not much to stop it. So we have been very vocal about the consequences of that, just the thought of that. And I know why there's, it was written for a particular area. However, they broadened it up for the state. So think through who you are as a district and think through your neighboring districts and it's by township. So what I did is I went through all your districts, I'll be honest, I went through all your districts, I started looking at townships because really the only say so that has anything to do with it, uh, athletics. It's kind of music to my ears right now. Um, <laughs> District B, that township that's getting captured, interestingly enough, if they petition, if they say no, we don't want you to take it, the only people that could vote to say no, if the township and District A say we're going, and that township has a vote, the entire district can't vote, just that little township, whoever lives there. So you may have 20 families that live there and the rest of them are in all these other townships, but your building's sitting there. You with me? But they're the only ones that can vote. So, you know, you get people that aren't paying attention or you have retirees that are like, I don't care, take it. We don't have to pay bills on it, go ahead. It doesn't work like that, but that's the way the bill is written. So. Pay attention to 429. I would highly suggest you look at it. Here's what I will also say about 421. It is high, it's very confusing. It's very complex. We've had a lot of attorneys look at it. So I know as superintendents and CFOs, as you look at that, pay attention to your debt. Pay attention to what that does with that school building because there's a lot of things on that school building. You're talking your AVs impacted because they're taking a piece of your AV now. I mean, there's a lot to that bill. So in addition to your ADM, which I think honestly is probably the least of your worries at that point, you have AV on the line, you have buildings on the line. If I'm a small district, one near me in Delaware County that was a small district, every single building was in one township. Now they had five townships within the district, but all the buildings were housed in one because 
they were all kind of one unit, kind of one campus. If I would have wanted that, I would have said, I'm going. All you got to do is schmooze some township board members and tuck your board into it. And there's not a whole lot that that exiting school can do. And it's called the relinquishing school, which, okay. So, but there's a lot to that bill that I think you probably need to pay attention. We've not been in that territory before, but if it goes, it goes. So I know it's been heard and it passed out. So, not, not made me pass out, but it passed out. Um, but just something to pay attention to. Any, I have more that I can cover on that last one, but another piece real quick was deregulation. Our schools are getting hammered by reports, by trainings, the list is forever. Our teachers are getting hammered by that. So in 1400, they introduced a bill that was pretty good about let's look at all this regulation. The problem in 1400 was it also stripped all of our federal special ed money. Yeah, that should get your attention. And it, and it and also stripped the constitutional right to a K-12 education. So you need to look at, we've tried to work with the authors and fix it. I don't think it was intended, um, but you probably need to look at that bill because with the DREGs, which we support, looking at all the things that are on our plate for reporting, that is 100% needed. But I think the unattended consequences in there, I hope just were overlooked. But when we started looking at it, we testified, your special ed dollars alone in the state of Indiana are $270 million. So you want me to go find that? I can't even get 18 for the STEM. So $270 million. That is something that is significant that we need to pay attention to. Again, I hope it was an unattended and we fix it but it's something we probably need to pay attention to. Our constitutional right to a K-12 education in Indiana is kind of important. So we're hoping that too was a, was a whoops and they're gonna fix it. So questions, I know you have no cards. Can you all hear me still? Yes. Okay. What is the plan to fund pre-K? Next, no. Um, <laughs> So we are, we are in favor of pre-K. All of you know the readiness issues coming at school, significant. We still have kids that I will talk to schools, they still have the kindergartners come into school that aren't potty trained, they don't know numbers from letters, I mean, it, it, train wreck. I mean, it, and so the pre-K piece is extremely important. On the way pre-K, we said we will support any expansion of that, and I would say too, many of our on the way pre-K programs are super, super successful, but many of them that are connected to our schools, that even is a boost because of that seamless streamline has been quite successful in some of our areas. Not in all, some of them it's not so successful, but in many of them it has been a very, very good thing. We do, ex we do um, I know the governor came out and said that they were looking at expansion. It's probably not to the degree, degree we want to see, but we have been very vocal on the importance of pre-K. We're also looking at assessment pieces in pre-K that gets pretty weedy, but something that's a little bit better, but we're not sure where that's gonna land. Will it be fully funded? No. I, I don't foresee that happening just because of DCS is gonna take a big chunk of money this year, and we're trying to get the other chunk, and then you're out because Social Security, Medicaid, and all kinds of stuff for the state. So, but pre-K, um, online pre-K, is it best practice for young learners? Well, I mean, we can all have that conversation with online pre-K. Many of them, it's not probably the best situation, but there are some students and some parents that would say, you know, we can do some things online that are, are good, but I mean, we can, have that conversation, but I, I would not say that 100% online is probably the best for all students. Um, yeah, I need my glasses. I am a CTE certified teacher. Okay, you're an endangered species. Where are you? I won't call you out because you might not want me to, but, but we need you in every school. And I am excited about the new career-oriented graduation partnering programs. Hang on, I'm trying to get the question here. Does the state or can the state have plans to develop a compensation plan to support the upcoming demands in CTE? So, the regional work. Okay, so a lot, you guys are. The readers. Look at you. <laughs> oh, 
my gosh, it's awesome to have people my age. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't happen at the universities. It's like, that doesn't happen. So with the CTE, I just set that down, now I can't find it. Um, with the CTEs, developing a comprehensive plan with career tech ed. Interesting, let's, what some of the stuff that's moving through is zero licensing requirements for career tech ed. That's in a bill right now, so there would be zero career tech ed licensing requirements, which is quite interesting. Um, but do we have a plan to develop a comprehensive to support the upcoming demands of CTE? With the regional work, a lot of that's coming out of the Governor's Workforce Development Commission, and so or the Cabinet, but there are two committees under that that we still serve on. Probably the biggest thing with CTE is such a moving target right now with Everything's a pathway right now, but bear with me on this. Through the academic cluster pathways, like your IT, ag, all the different ones that fall into career tech ed, there will probably be a pocket of those that are funded in relationship to your region. And I know this region has been very aggressive in business partnerships and it's a good thing. But a lot of that's going to be based on your region working with your high schools to help them defend why they're spending money and why they're reporting the way they're reporting. So it's going to be a new day. But 1002 is another bill to pay attention to with workforce because it addresses some of this. I cannot remember, and I should, um, I can get back with you guys, but the bill that has no licensing, I think is 1002 as well. Um, but that is the bill that says, you know, run the CTE courses and, and not worrying about the teacher licensing. So that, that will get interesting. But a lot of work, I know we're working on our new Perkins 5, which is the new federal plan. But a lot of that honestly has been taken out of our hands and into Department of Workforce Development. So we're trying to kind of budge our way in and keep our way in, but a lot of it's gonna come out of our our department, which is, I don't think is healthy, but I don't, that's above my authority. Um, why is the charter school graduation so low? That's a great question. So I will say uh, some of the charter schools are doing a much better job than others, but I would say, I mean, that's true with traditional schools as well, and all of you know that, but a lot of it is if you look at some of the mobility, it's high, it's high. We're also a state in Indiana, if you look at other states who have done charters, their quality control is super tight. I would argue our authorizer that has the tightest quality control for inputs would be the mayor of Indianapolis's office. So under Mayor Ballard, he has layers and layers and layers and layers for an authorizer to get in and then what that operator looks like. Many of them aren't like that. Many of them, it is, I'm like, man. So the quality control piece is concerning, which may play into it, but mobility is always going to be a factor in that area. Post-graduation evaluation. Um, whose question was this? Is this the one with the new bill? Post-graduation evaluation? Yeah, there's one or two bills. Left. Yeah, so if you're talking about the accountability, 1404, which is really giving me fits right now, high, that goes back to that high school accountability. A huge chunk of it you will be responsible for six months after a kid graduates. So you're the high school principal, they graduate. Six months after that, they need to track, are they employed? Not defining employability, whether it's meaningful. It hasn't gone that far yet. Are they employed? Are they enlisted? Or are they, what's their status in college and have they earned 12 credit hours? At that university, not your dual credits, but at that university. So here's what I will say. That accountability bill with the post-graduation is very much about programs. You can already track programs. We can already track that as a state. I can tell you a lot. The DWD can tell you a lot. We can tell you that. We already collect that information. But I'm not sure it fits in a high school accountability piece. Now, would high school principals tell you they're partially responsible for the success of the graduates? Yes, I mean, yes. But is it appropriate to land in an accountability piece? First of all, we don't have a mechanism in the state to track out-of-state workers. So if you, hire, if you have a worker and they go to Chicago, you're out of luck, you're a failure. Strike one. So that's a problem. If you have a student who goes out of state up here, they go you Chicago, strike two. So there are a lot of pieces of it that are concerning because it is heavy in that six, I heard nine months, but right now the language is six months. That is something that we brought up about 
the realistic part of that, you can be super successful as a school and get a child to IU and life happens. And you had, I mean, you can't control some of that, whether the kid gets ill, whether they just can't get it together, whether they found partying, whatever the case may be, and they don't make it. You are responsible. It's your accountability. So we, we're struggling with 1404 high school principles. If you haven't looked at it, it's gonna give you some heartburn. It really is very limiting, but it's very heavy in programs. Heavy in programs. It doesn't care about graduation rate. Doesn't care about that. It cares about programs. And so we, we philosophically have a problem that we've moved from student performance to programs. So I think you have to pay attention to how we're doing in those programs as a state, absolutely, as we're funding things. But you all know right now that accountability system is sending the message that we're worried about the next four years. And I keep saying we're worried about the next four decades for a kid. We, we can't worry about the next four years. We're trying to prepare them with great skills forever. So it's just been interesting. But the post-graduation evaluations in 1404, you, just ha you, you really do need to pay attention to it. The teachers are un not underpaid. Well, yeah. Okay, so this is about their legislators are saying the teachers aren't underpaid and with the cost of living. We're giving them a lot of data and you do have some General Assembly people paying attention to the rate of inflation, what's happening with the, with, there's such a disparity in pay across the state for beginning teachers and top of the scale teachers. There's a lot moving on. Now, I think it's a good thing we're starting to have conversation again about the steps, you know, as far as your experience and your degrees. That's coming back without that 33% weighing in on that when you're trying to do that compensation model. So there are some good things happening. The conversation about teachers are already, they're not underpaid. They're doing some comparison to other professions and really pulling that up and getting aggressive. So they're looking at, look at a nurse at this years of experience. They worked how many days a year? Look at a teacher. So they're starting to do those comparisons. I, I would push back, and, and many of you are pushing back too. We've provided them the data we can provide, but we can't do that alone. You all have a voice. Many of your superintendents have used that voice. Many of your CFOs, many of your teachers have used that voice. We can't have that conversation alone. What they don't love is when they get canned emails. So if your organization says, we're going to send out this email, everybody hit send, they will delete, 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 delete. They don't even look at it. You have to craft it in a good way where it, it is, you are talking about your community, be very concise in your bullets, don't get wordy, no dissertations, I mean keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it factual, that's what they're looking for. But I know that's going on. I think when monies get tight, the easiest thing to do is to start fighting back going, you already get paid enough or you're already getting paid as well as Midwestern states. I mean, that whole rhetoric's changing again because if they can't find the money and they're getting nervous about finding the money, you just start saying whatever someone else will buy. So you all know that. I know it's getting pretty noisy in the papers and things too about that. But yes, that rhetoric is going on. What trainings are available for the dyslexia mandate? Yeah, um, we are working on that. I mean, as a department, the dyslexia came through. Obviously, there are a lot of pieces attached to that. We were a little bit worried because we heard that there was going to come, in addition to dyslexia, some other like autism, the same type of like you screen everybody. I'm like, okay, I'm a special ed teacher. That makes zero sense. But there were pieces of that that were coming through. That has died down. But we do have training available. And I think I have, okay, I have an email and we will get with you about the dyslexia training. A lot of it's on uh, are posted on our website. But we have um, a gentleman on our at our department who is specifically for that and so we will make sure we hook them up with you. That's a long one. Student attendance. Yeah, this is about parent accountability and I, I don't know who wrote this but I, I do 100% agree with you because right now we're talking about chronic absenteeism, watching that absenteeism. Schools can do, uh, very, honestly, I hate to say this, you, 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 you battle it. You make the calls, you're doing the home visits, you're tracking down the letters of incapacity, you're working with your probation officers, it's hard. I mean, I'll be the, it, it, it's tough. If you have a student who's not showing up to school, sometimes you can't find them. 
I mean, that's the reality of it. They're very mobile. Sometimes they're with dad, sometimes they're with mom, sometimes sometimes they're with whatever. So it, it, it is tough, but the parent accountability piece, I will say in some states that's gone a little f further than it will never, I, in Indiana, that's probably not ever going to enter into that because you start getting into home. So. Um, I agree. It's it's a it's a huge problem as far as keeping those people responsible. I think that all goes back to a lot of it goes back to to data sharing, because a part of this is if if we're limited in that area, you have to have data that's available to share. So if you have students who, you know, got arrested last night. You didn't even know they were on probation. You have no idea where they are. Some of you have good relationships with those partners and sometimes your parents will not let you know that. Some of you are struggling with that. We're trying to do better partner share so at least that parent knows you have the whole picture. But it, it's tough. I know I'm not gonna pretend I have the answers to that but I understand that is a big frustration. <laughs> well, this is about a statewide teacher strike potential about how public schools, how are we going to support what they need to be effective. You know, obviously I can't go around and tell you to do something illegal. Um, but I do understand the frustration in other states. I mean, you're watching cities like LA Unified and Oakland's getting ready to go and they're walking away with some sweet deals. So I know people are watching things. I would never say go out and do, I mean, I, I'm not being a huge proponent of that but I also know too there is a way you can use your voice there is a way you can use your voice and again I think we're woefully underusing it you have powers and numbers and I even go back to the day I mean I you know Dr. Bennett and, and um, Superintendent Ritz is a perfect example of when educators mobilize they mobilize and so people are very cognizant of that but you have to have organized mobilization. I'm not saying that means in a strike, but that also means in you have a voice, you have a voice to vote, which brings me to my position. So my position will become an appointed position here in the next two years. That bill's gonna go through, so don't get your hopes up. It's gonna go through. So that position will become, an, my position will become appointed. Indiana will be unique in that there is very little voter voice other than the governor into my position. Many other states either have like the Senate confirmation, like the, the governor gives their, you know, their choice and there's a confirmation, or it's done through a state board that's in a voted elected board. There's some type of voice other than one person, the governor's position. I, I keep telling people, pay attention. And I don't care what political affiliation you are, I, it, it's irrelevant to me, but here's what I will say, pay attention. If that next governor race comes, and someone doesn't say this is who I'm running with to send you the signal of what are you what's to, to inform you of their philosophy of education it's gonna tell you a lot it's gonna tell you a lot if that question is not answered I, I would start paying attention to it that is the question because if you watch the last governmental the last governor's race very little conversation about education very little odd very little conversation However, when my position becomes an appointed, appointed position and, and that person, whomever the governor would be, is going to have great power over education and what happens to the future of public education, I certainly would start asking some questions. We give people a lot of passes. I would certainly, they didn't give me a pass when I was running for office. People were like, you're the next thing coming from Satan. I was like, okay, well, <laughs> we'll see. So, but I didn't get a pass. I would just say, well, why are we giving a pass to the highest position in the state? I would just ask questions. Again, I don't care what political affiliation you are. Ask questions. We need some answers of who are you running? It's just, or what are your beliefs? What, what are you thinking? Because that is going to be extremely, extremely important this next election. Got off on a tangent there. Um, situation where special needs. Okay, so I'll, I'll get with you on the bullying special needs question. So we got your contact? Nope. Whoever wrote this on the bullying special needs question, see me and we will make sure we, we chat. Any other questions? I don't even know where I'm out of time. No? Are you planning on running for government? <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. My glasses. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. You know, if you paid attention to my last campaign, I wasn't super good at raising money 
for a lot of reasons. Um, but I, I appreciate it. I, I know, I mean, I, I appreciate it. But right now, I, I mean, I will serve the state in some capacity for kids because I believe in what we do. And I think Indiana has great opportunity. I mean, I really do. But right now, I would say no. But I, I appreciate that's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> like tomorrow morning when I'm upstairs at the General Assembly, I, I'm really going to hunt you down. <laughs> Any of you running for governor? <laughs> I learned a lot about how to run a campaign. I'm like, I'm in for you. <laughs> Wasn't very good at it, but learned a lot. Any other questions? Yes. I know that they just did a count on February 1st. And charter schools, as far as I remember, everyone has to do that count on February 1st. What, what data do we have that students who went to charter in September remained in those charters or have not left? Because I would be curious to see if the charters are holding that money and then removing students or telling them to go back to their public schools or how can we find out that information because that's very good information to have. Yeah, we have that. We have all that information because honestly we have General Assembly asking for it and we're watching a mobility report. So what we're really watching is kind of after that first count day, who stays and who goes. Because that second count day today, it is kind of a, um, it doesn't have money tied to it. So we're watching that information. We're watching who's popping from traditional charters to virtual charters or traditional publics to non-pubs. We're watching those numbers the best we can. Right now, it's, it's sometimes hard because we have homeschool in that mix too, which we have a large, large population of Indiana homeschoolers that are popping in and out of that mix too. But we have all that that we have presented because what we hear a lot of is you all take, I say you all, the public schools take the money and then and you, you encourage them to go elsewhere. But when we look at the data, that's really not the story. So we wanted to make sure that, yeah, mobility happens. Absolutely mobility happens. But the, the um, sometimes there are certain people that want, to, want it to be perceived that we're kicking them all out. You know, you take the money and you kick them out. But really, if you look at the data, it's, it's not showing that. So we have it all. Um, we'd be happy to share it. It's not a big secret, but we, we have all that data, yeah. It's a good question. We've been sharing a lot of data. Could you clarify something for me? When yeah. you talking about the, um, this, this game of, it's, it's like a board game, the township, yeah. the grab. Is this a school within another township, or is this within the same township where a school can, a district can kind of do a package? Yeah, uh, yeah, that District A would be a, uh, its own district. District B. District. district B is a separate district. Within the same township? Nope. So the township doesn't overlap. So in the scenarios that we're seeing, it would be a township that's 100% within District B that would be kind of captured <laughs> and brought over to District A. So there's, there may be a sharing of students because of open enrollment, but it's within District B's district. So there are shared townships. It'll be interesting on how does that play out. But what we're seeing is literally townships that are 100% within a different district would then get um, annexed into a new district. But remember, there's nothing that that relinquishing school district can really do. That's what gets so interesting about it. Like it, 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 it really does get interesting. Now, if there's a school building on that, that's where it also gets layered up. Well, what is the thought process behind that? Well, agreed, agreed. <laughs> and here's the thing. Well, and, and, and here's the thing. I mean, honestly, it's it, sometimes in the state you have situations where someone has an appetite for that, and they're trying, and, and maybe in that area they want to do it. But when you write, write it that broad, it, it becomes. I would hope that that we wouldn't see a whole lot of that. But I will tell you, when you have districts that are declining in enrollment, you have school boards upset, you have people that are like, we're already transporting those kids, go get them, you know, get their, go get their operation funds, go get their tax base. Y you, will, you will have some of that. So uh, that was what we were trying to say, Care you gotta be careful with that. I mean, it really could get quite interesting that if you le take a small district and you pull 400 kids out of an 800 person district, you, you're, you're done. 
I mean, 50% of your kids are gone, and it happens fast. The other part of that that I didn't mention because we're trying to figure some things out, like how, how do you not do this this way, but this is the way the bill's written. Once the District A and the township say go and the relinquishing schools like what just happened, it goes to the state board, which is a whole other conversation. It goes to the state board of education for, for them to review the plan that District A and the relinquish are in that little township had. And if the state board says, yeah, that's a good plan, then they go. If they say that's not a good plan, then you, there's kind of a process that people can fight it either way. But the only people that could fight it in the relinquishing District B are just the people who reside in that township, which could be very minimal in some of our areas, but you could have a building sitting there. You have a lot of kids going to that school, but they don't all live there. So it's just interesting. And then it, where, where does that stop? So if District A wants Township A, Township B, Township C, uh, so does it also work the other way like some of the other states where people are disenfranchising people of color and other communities that they are actually kicking out and refusing to serve it um yeah we were seeing some of those indications of uh schools saying yeah you can go over here we don't we don't really want you in our district anymore it w whether it's open enrollment or not you know it's like they are just like literally taking communities of color and saying you can go be in this district now and that could happen if you have an agreement with district a and district b if district a says hey we want you and district b says go take them that could happen I, I, we're not with open enrollment i mean obviously if they're within your district public schools have to take the child with a couple cop little minor maybe nots but so many of our districts are taking open enrollment. That's what we were saying. If they already have open enrollment for a lot of our schools, that's already happening. But to capture, because, and the CFOs know this, that AV piece, if you take a big township and that's got your significant AV in it, your assessed valuation and a building, I mean, the layers of that become, how, how do you even start wrapping your mind about how to plan for that? It's, it's a lot. Ms. Holly. According to the question I asked, to get the follow up on the CTE licensing, I reached out to our legislative affairs team and they said that um, House Bill 10 and 2 says that um, a school or secondary vocation school may employ an instructor who does not have a license if they meet a certain occupational training requirement. Is that the bill number you need? Yeah, so 1002 is the bill that doesn't require a teaching license for CTE. I missed this when I walked in, but all the information you shared with the slides and in your presentation, is that on the Department of Education website or where do we access all this? So Holly, who was a kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher, tech, tech director extraordinaire, now comms director, um, she will get it to Dr. Or Dr. Lux. Can we get it? Who do we need to get it to? Yeah, we can put it on, we can put it on our website. Okay, we will get it. It'll be on the Northwest Indiana Coalition. For sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. We can get that to you. As we uh, live, we made a webcast too, and we're doing this too, so everything will be there too. Mm, okay, great. What is the current climate with uh, the state board and yourself? Great. Great. <laughs> 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 okay. So it's it, it's interesting. I, I mean, I'm no longer the chair, which is a beautiful thing. Um, but I was a chair for two years. The chair position is honestly irrelevant because it was a matter of approving an agenda, but when I showed up at the meeting, it usually changed anyway. And so, but there was really no big relevance to it other than the stressor of running, the, making sure you keep the cat, people corralled. And so uh, now, you know, that has shifted and we have new chairs and uh, it, does, it really honestly is irrelevant. But that governance structure is really hard. And it's not hard because of I'm in that position. I don't care who's in this position. Glenda went through it and, and you know, she had good intent, but it was, it was hard on her and I 100% understand why. I mean, it is tough because because the governance structure doesn't make sense. So I came from local superintendent where I had a board, you have your you know, superintendent, that relationship works different. This is nothing like that, nothing like that. So it is an appointed board, primarily from the governor's office with a couple, with myself, and then the speaker has one, the pro tem has a person. And so it's really the governor's board. So 
there and, and I get it and that's where if if the next you know regardless of the next governor's race the governor will have a lot of power if they keep the state board in place it's really the governor's board and then my office would become the governor's position I mean it will be heavy 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 you that's where you have to pay attention and ask questions about what is your philosophy toward public education what's your philosophy on funding public education what's your philosophy on how that board operates because I mean it's it's difficult and it's not what I would argue what's best for any of us I mean it's just difficult so but would just great on if you were appointed should the state superintendent stay on if they're appointed? No, I mean, if you, if you were, if the next governor... Oh, that's cute. If it's state... <laughs> <laughs> from the same school district. Okay. We beg it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would depend on who, that, who the person appointing is. So I think it's important for that alignment. I think it, I, it, education is extreme. I and mean, it's all, like all of you. I mean, you believe in what we do. I believe in public education. I believe in our kids and our educators. And um, that person would have to be aligned to that belief. And so it, it would depend. It would, be, but, but thank you. You guys teamed up, didn't you? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Not mine now. <laughs> Earlier you addressed teacher retention and yeah. you talked about 35% um, of teachers leaving the profession within um, years one through five. Yeah. Do you believe that House Bill um, 1008 that was written by Benning effectively addresses that issue? And if so, um, how can this be funded other than by grants? House Bill addresses career ladder. Yeah. So first of all let me say with the 35 percent that lead between one and five when we survey those folks 88 percent of them it was by pay but then the next second tier was just working conditions and this isn't a blast on administrators it's the job is hard so acknowledging that right off the bat so getting that out there we have shared all that information all of our survey data all that do I think it will come up with a solution to that. I think anytime we can have career ladders that helps develop teacher leaders is not a bad thing. But at a time where the monies are so tight and I'm watching a lot of our bills go through with big price tags on them, like if you have all that money, you stick it in the formula. Stick in the formula. Many of you are finding creative ways to fund those teacher leadership activities. And I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but it's hard for me when I'm watching one of the bills go through right now has about a $5 million price tag on it, and we have the exact same thing we can do right now that we've been doing for two years. Well, what are we doing? Give me that $5 million on the, on the basic tuition support. So I, I have to push back a little bit that the intent is good, the idea is not bad, but if we have money for that, at a time where we are hearing there's no money, put it on basic tuition support and then let local people make decisions. So that's where I get a little bit, if you got the money for this and this and this and this, you start adding this and this and this and this up, put it toward basic tuition support, get that up. So we'll see. Thank you. Where is it with the school calendar and start date? Um, we're not hearing much of that. It's the same thing that comes back every time about after Labor Day and the whole cursive writing from a <laughs> May to a shall. So, um, but it, it, we're not hearing a lot of conversation about it. I don't think it will get much traction, but it always comes up. Yeah, it's workforce related. Interesting on that same note, um, if you're paying attention, like the high school folks that have kids that are employed and they have to get their work permits and all that, if you're watching that, Wow, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a bill impacting child labor laws, basically. Um, that's another interesting one where it's kind of a free-for-all. So, wow, not that I'm opposed to kids working. I worked as a high schooler and worked a lot, but that's an interesting bill. Uh, since the uh, job of educating children of Indian is really one of the main things the state should be doing, why should communities have to uh, uh, for money with referendum. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I had the answer to that, but I will say some of the meetings I've been having, they're very, very direct. 
um, and letting me know they're not super convinced that we're wise with our spending. I would push back that you have a lot of schools that are have been very efficient with their spending and very wise with their spending, but their revenue does not look like it used to look. And so their solution is you've got the revenue, you've got the mechanism for referendum. And now Senator Holman's been a good partner, so I don't want this to seem negative, but now we have a third option for referendum if it goes through, which it probably will, for safety. So we've got operating, you've got construction, and you would have a safety referendum, which I would think a safety referendum in most of our communities may have more luck. But again, you're creating the haves and the have nots with, with some of our referendums. So I know it's difficult. I, I, I have the same questions you're asking. I don't have a good answer for you, but I think those are the very questions that we need to start asking folks who are getting elected. Like, what is your stance on referendums? What is your stance on funding as adequately and equitably? And so those are the questions, but I, I don't have a good answer for you, but I will be, I mean, I, I was, I've sit in meetings where they're telling me it's my problem because I'm like, for them, I'm you. Um, it's my problem because you, we all need to figure it out. Well, it's, it's hard. So I, I don't have a good answer for you, but that is really, we've heard from a lot of higher up political position people saying that is your answer. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Uh, you referenced <coughs> the uh, social emotional mm -hmm. Has there been any more research on the trauma? Um, our area up here is getting a lot of trauma. Yeah. Um, back and forth. You know, they, the kids come and then they go. Then they come and then they go. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to see a shift <coughs> in pre-K to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. It's just huge. Yeah. So that trauma-informed care piece is big. And so the department has been better at the end of the table for those conversations across agency because you have pockets. Like if you're in Marion County, you have a lot of access to some care. You get out across the state and that doesn't always look like that. And so many of you have dealt with that. Like, okay, I got this kid in crisis and the connection to care for a lot of different reasons is really hard. So there is more conversation going on. I would say we're probably not as far along as we should be because it's impacting all of us but the good thing is it's moving it's moving in the right direction but yeah have they considered since they're kind of forcing us into a referendum type of thought process we're about ready to we're deeply exploring that right now mm -hmm. in our district which is an Elkhart with a brand new superintendent and high schools that will be merging within the next two years and um, we've had so, a lot of asks lately of our community our biggest pushback is our farmers because of their property piece have they considered helping us be more successful with our referendum by possibly putting a cap on the amount of of uh, land or whatever our farmers would have to pay we don't want to put them out of business trying to cover these referendums and we have a our district's unusual very rural very mm -hmm. urban very big mm -hmm. spread out and so I, I we just have it's going to be a big tough sell I, I'm not hearing that, but I don't think it's a bad thing to start thinking about some language that if you think what what possibly, and I'm not saying you get specific because that's a big ask, but maybe some of those like what would that look like or at least talking to your General Assembly members to say, have you thought of this? I think that's a good question. I think it's something you probably need to start reaching out now. You're not alone in that and would probably help a lot of districts in that same scenario, but that's what I'm hearing when people say, I've got this and this and this, and I know it's going to be an uphill battle that's like this. Yeah. And so you weigh those options and are like, I, I, I'm going to kill my administrative staff. I'm going to kill my teaching staff. I'm going to, you know, it, it is a huge lift to run those referendums. But I think it's a great question. I've not heard anybody really entertain that, but I would encourage you to start asking. I think that's a great question. It helps us too. You know, we're talking. Districts, come on, let's listen. 
I tell you, there are I mean, power in numbers, and and they know when I say something, I I it's kind of like now they're just like getting aggravated at me right now, but when you all say something because they know you are extremely connected and respected in your districts, they know that you know families, they know you, they usually are you're highly respected. If you email with ideas or you go to your general assembly, that goes miles because then they tell me, hey, what are you doing? You get people stirred up. I'm like, I didn't get people stirred up. You're getting people stirred up. So we have that little conversation. But it goes a long way if you reach out and say, hey, you know, well, let's rethink some things here. Or have you thought of this? It comes very different when it comes from you because you are connected to their voters. So don't, don't underestimate that. I'm from a rural community, too. My brother has been local president of the Farm Bureau and so forth. But you might partner with the Farm Bureau. Nice. They would be happy to get a cap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, Jennifer. Um, two counties remain in the state that will not experience the full circuit breaker impact until 2020. You've shown the success and failure rates or attempt rates um, with the new fiscal indicators that are coming out by yeah. 2 because they're going to keep a pulse on everyone. Yep. Could we formulate something? Because I can tell you exactly um, when DUAB will probably have to come to my school district because we cannot pass a referendum. So if we do do have those numbers to, to say, hey, look, for those that are saying, <coughs> I'll just go get a referendum, okay. and you just never can, because we know that's gonna that's our, that's mm -hmm. our statistic. That could be the that could be the force that says, okay, here's how many school districts, and when you're going to have to take them over. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and I mean, you know what I mean. Yeah. I don't know if that number would help them because do we have going to come? I mean, they're going to have those indicators that so might help us. Right. But you know that the fiscal indicators are that piece that your superintendents or your CFOs are going to submit information and then your distress unit appeals board is going to look at that information based on what's submitted. They're going to look at those fiscal indicators and they're going to determine if you're in trouble or not, if you're on a watch list, if you're in corrective action. But I would also caution in 10.03, I think, in 10.03, that gets even more aggressive. So I'm saying let the fiscal indicators play out. And I think you're right. I think we could probably project out to say, hey, you're getting 20 coming at you. Because that is a big lift. And I can tell you, superintendents and people know, CFOs know, they're coming for us. And OK, I mean, we know they are. So you might as well come on and get it. The other piece is you have to go in front of the state board and basically get publicly shamed. Mm -hmm but they don't have any authority or power to help you. So I have a problem with a district having to go before a board. I'm okay with DUAB because those fiscal indicators are supposed to help you. They're supposed to be proactive with, in a partnership with the, uh, with the school boards association or with the um, school business association. But on the other one, it's you go in front of the school board, the state board of education, and you get publicly shamed, but they don't have the capacity to help you. So that's just a public meeting to say, we didn't hit 85, 15%, and we didn't hit fiscal indicators, and we didn't, we didn't, it's just like really? So that piece, I think you're right, providing as much data as we can up front to say get ready, and, and then it let inform some of those comments we're hearing about referendums your answer. I mean, honestly, and if you've been to any of our business officials just had a conference and our school board just had a conference and literally they said the people who were addressing them about fiscal were saying you have an answer, it's go run a referendum. And I hear that all the time. I mean, that's the answer you're getting. We don't have the money. We don't have the revenue. We're not going to spend out of our surplus. Go around a referendum. So it, it is. I think you're right. If we're smart about how to provide the data to help inform that, the smarter we are with that, probably the better off we'll be. Because I think you're right. We can pretty much tell them what's going to happen. What is the conversation around consolidation? Because some of our school districts are never going to pass a referendum. And the answer, we have been downstate. We listened to what the legislators said. They said, oh, well, if, this, if your community doesn't value education, oh, well. And so, and my question back to them was, and so what about my children that deserve equity? 
what do I do? But then, you know, it keeps coming back to that point of consolidation. And then I go, consolidate with who? You don't want me over here. You're failing over here. Where do I go? Mm -hmm. So let's go back to 421. <laughs> So 421 is that piece where it's, there's not consolidation ever mentioned in 421. But you're right because if, if you have a district that has pockets of kids that look pretty good on paper, I hate to say it, but you, you can cherry pick areas now. So it's not, there's no mention of consolidation, but what would that be then? I mean, what is that? So I think that's where it's coming out uh, without coming up. When I read it, that's where I went. Like, this is really pretty creative because the word never comes up. But if you pay attention now, I'm not just consolidating. I'm picking. Like, I want this group from this territory. I'm doing my homework. Like, this area, no, nah, I don't want them. I want this. You know, you can start cherry picking townships. So there's not a whole lot. There's an incentive pot of money to consolidate. But the other, that 421, I think, is that. Question. Are we, um, just like looking at the big picture, and for me, I'm a former teacher, so now I'm just a regular citizen. And how, how do you, like, what's your question? We want you back. <laughs> yeah, no, don't laugh. We want you back. Um, um, but what's your best, best advice to um, disseminate this information to the general public? You know, we're talking about moms and dads yeah. and grandparents who are overloaded, working multiple jobs, and they're just trying to get by. But how do you convey that there, you know, there are greater voice of forces at work of privatization? You know, we're, we're breaking down the public good here, right? I mean, that's what this is. They're, mm -hmm. they're taking away something that is for the public good. Yeah. And we can talk about House Bill 1003 and 421, but it's all about privatizing. It's all about breaking up public schools, breaking unions, and taking away the fabric of our communities. How in easy, digestible chunks do we uh, bring this over to the general public? Talking to those moms and dads, talking to our neighbors. What is your advice for that? I, I think your best avenue, honestly, is social media. So many of you are connected on social media, and I know that gets dicey when you start getting I mean, some of those social media. I don't do Facebook for a lot of reasons, but some of you who do, that is a good avenue to share snapshots of information. If you start layering that, people aren't going, but if, if once in a while you put some out, did you, like, did you know X? Sharing that information I don't think is ever a bad thing, but I think that social media is powerful. So we have people who use it better than others, but also being strategic about, so you don't look crazy with it, <laughs> and you look reasonable with it, but it's those interesting, we tried to do that with our priority pitches, to put out little factual things and just put them out there, and I'll be honest with you, on our social media, teachers don't love that. They don't love it when I get political on them. I see social media, they're like, eh, stop it. But when I say something fluffy, they're like, 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 like. So it's interesting. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so, and I get it because that's kind of who we are. Now, superintendents don't do that. I say something political, they're like, retreat, retreat, retreat. So it's just interesting. So, but I think social media is, is big. And I always said, if we get organized in a manner that really is smart, boy, I mean, it, it, it could be really a force, but it is informing people. My sister's a nurse, and when I tell her something, she's like, you gotta tell people that. Nobody knows that. And I'm like, okay. You know, so, but I understand why it's that frustration of you have significant knowledge of what's going on, and most people don't have it. And it's hard to spread it without looking like you're just feeling sorry for ourselves or we're complaining. I think sharing a facts, like, did you know X? Did you know Y? And it's just, like I say, facts are stubborn. People sometimes don't like them. But... I think the social media part would, if some, and it would take or an organized effort to do it well. And I think it can be done. I mean, I really do. I mean, I don't know what you're doing now, but since you're not teaching, you may have free time. <laughs> I, know that, I know that woman. She has no free time. I know that woman. She doesn't sleep. She's doing Medicare for all. Oh, you don't have free time. You don't have free time. Yeah. I want to piggyback on what she was saying because I keep asking myself, what is the incentive of the government to privatize <coughs> education? <laughs> but, they're, but they want that control of that education, but they're not controlling, there aren't those layers of control um, in private um, 
education in um, uh, charter school. They want control out. You break it after you told everyone thinking? it's broken, and then you can sell it. Yeah. Look at yeah. here. Look at here. The real roots of it started at the Roundy Board of Ed. And when people found out that they had to integrate their schools, they decided they were going to make a separate parallel system of schools. And that's where it started. And you cannot, from my opinion, walk away from the ultimate roots of where that started. In the reality, honestly, that we can't forget Anytime you're over half of a state's budget, we're 54% of the state's budget, we are expensive. We're $8 billion a year and another billion in federal monies. So we're $9 billion a year. Anytime you are half of the state any, of any budget, any budget, when you're over half of that, you have all eyes on you to reduce that and to fix that. And so it's interesting because just the, the sake of vouchers, you know, that program was put in place for at-risk kids who needed to get out of F schools. Now we're learning about 2% have even been in an F school, and it's really going to suburban white. And so we're watching that program, but that's that mentality of free market. Let people choose. They're paying taxpayer dollars. It's just a different philosophy in it really goes back to choice and how do you get those costs down and they believe I mean it's no so different than you know we promoted virtual charters you fund those at 90 percent you're, you're getting those costs down so there's a lot to do with the money tied to it there's a lot to do with philosophy of it but I have still a lot of meetings where they are very quick to tell me we are not getting the job done no matter how much they give us and they're, they're not virtual schools and Charter schools are definitely not getting the job done. So some. I mean, it's, uh, some are. They're performing well, but many of them aren't. Many, many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I don't understand. They, but they but they're, the they're funded differently. So they don't get operation monies. They don't get property tax monies. So they are a cheaper way to educate students of Indiana. But if they're not educating well... Uh, I, I, I'm just, yeah, I agree with you, but, but you're, they're getting those costs. I mean, you're really looking at how to get those costs down. Okay, I'm losing everybody. So lastly, I know people are, try, are going and I get you're all busy, but I want to thank you. I know many of you are still in the trenches. Thank you for you who are putting up the good fight. Thank you. Do not hesitate to reach out to our office. We don't get it all right. If we're getting something wrong, do not be shy. Many of you aren't. So let us know. But thank you again for having us up, and I appreciate everything you're doing. Thanks. Thank you.